what's on second? Who's on second? Who's on first? I don't know. Third base. <laughs> This is a story about the gift of laughter. It begins here along the Passaic River in Patterson, New Jersey. It is the dawn of the 20th century. short distance from these calm waters where once Indians fished for food there was a little house on Madison Street on March the 6th 1906 a baby's cries were heard here for the first time Sebastian Cristillo and his wife Helen were celebrating the birth of their second child they named him Louis Francis Cristillo little did they dream that one day their infant's cries would bring laughter to every continent on the earth. Patterson was unique. America's oldest industrial city, it was founded by Alexander Hamilton. Within the city limits is Garrett Mountain, created by the last ice age. It overlooks all of northern New Jersey. The New York City skyline is also visible from here. On the side of the mountain facing Patterson is Lambert Castle, and a great tower is perched atop the summit. On carefree summer days, a young boy playing here might imagine himself to be in Scotland. Also in the city's borders is the Great Falls of the Passaic River. As the river winds its way downstream, it passes an area where America's industry was born. Dozens of factory buildings dotted the banks of the river, forming the backbone of a pulsating industrial giant. There were so many silk mills that Patterson became known as the Silk City. Some sprawling factories dated back before the Civil War. Great locomotive engines were forged here. They were shipped all over the world. You could find almost any ethnic background here. Irish, Italian, German, Polish, Jewish, peoples of many races and tongues. Yes, the Patterson that shaped young Louis Cristillo was a true melting pot. It was America itself in miniature. But let someone who was there at the time tell of it. Meet Lou Costello's cousin, Mr. Lou Reege, 
only five years younger than his famous relative, Mr. Reed grew up in the same neighborhood only a few houses away from his cousin. Well, Patterson, as we like to remember it, was a city of manufacturing. And it was a busy, bustling place. We, we, made, we manufactured silk, we dyed the silk. Patterson was divided into neighborhoods, in a sense, ethnic, whatever. <clears throat> and um, in each neighborhood, there was a, a support system built right into the community. Patterson was a, a place for things to get done and be done. It was a gathering point of immigrants from all over the world came to work in Patterson. So that my memories of Patterson is a bustling, hustling, good place to live. It was a time when the automobile was just coming into vogue. Anyone of stature had a horseless carriage, and a whole new industry was born that would transform America. Young Lou Cristillo could only wonder what marvels lay ahead. One such marvel was the motion picture. The first movie to tell a story, Thomas Edison's The Great Train Robbery, was filmed right here on Garrett Mountain in Patterson on the Lackawanna Railroad tracks. It featured the cinematic debut of ham acting. There were fights, chases, explosions, villains and heroes, and in this fight scene, a dummy is substituted for the good guy. After being pummeled, it is thrown over the side of the train. At that exact moment, a real-life trolley car was passing under Garrett Mountain, and the conductor thought a body had fallen or jumped off the mountain. Patterson's topography was so unique that it lent itself to creating the illusion of almost any landscape. Here at Lambert Castle, Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford made movies. On this same spot on Garrett Mountain, young Lou Cristillo and his boyhood pals played at what they called King of the Hill, as Lou Reed remembers. I played up there, you bet I did, and uh, many a time I got driven off out of that neighborhood by the boys that live in that neighborhood. That was King of the Hill, and the Lambert's Castle with that tower you may, not know, or may or may not know on top, that was a, a, a challenge to us. We came from other neighborhoods, and when we got in that neighborhood, we were driven off by stones. In those days, there was nothing bad. No knives, no guns, nothing like that. But not with Lou. I never did that with Lou. Well, bear in mind that Lou was five years older than I was, and a 10-year-old and a 15-year-old don't play together. But we were around and about constantly. He went to the same school I did. He was ahead of me in school and all that. So I, and honestly, 15-year-olds don't tolerate 10-year-olds. So we were close, but we didn't play together. Young Lou was a daredevil. He used to go swimming here in the basin at the very foot of the Great Falls, as Lou Reed recalls. He did, and so did I. We all did. It, the, the police would chase us because it was dangerous, you know, but we would do that until the cops chased us, yes. He was a mischievous kid. He, he did things, but he didn't do takeoffs, he didn't do imitations, he didn't do things like that, and he didn't tell jokes either. He wasn't, wasn't that sort. He was more of a sight comedian. He did funny little things with his body, he could flip-flop and... He was very acrobatic. He was not the little fat guy he turned out to be later. He was very, very nimble on his feet. Lou was fascinated with the movies. He was especially intrigued with Charlie Chaplin, and he began to dream about emulating his great hero and becoming a movie star himself. One Halloween, when Lou was about 10 years old, he dressed up as Chaplin for a costume contest at the Patterson Armory. He marched around doing pratfalls and he won first prize. On mild summer nights, Lou would sit next to his mother on their big front porch swing, and looking up at the moon shining through the leaves of the neighborhood trees, he would say, Mom, one day I'm going to be a movie star and make you proud of me. You just wait and see. You'll be the most famous mom in all the world. Then, warm and content in his belief, he would go to bed, snuggle down under the covers, and fall peacefully asleep while the moon in the western sky would cast the shadow of Garrett Mountain over the city and the music of the river would be singing in the distance. How wonderful it is to be young and filled with hopeful dreams.
About 50 miles south of Patterson, as the seagull flies, lies the New Jersey Shore community of Asbury Park. At the turn of the century, this oceanfront resort was home to a show business couple named Ray and Harry Abbott. Ray was a bareback rider in the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus, and Harry did publicity work for the show. He was also involved in organizing something called burlesque. In 1895, they had a son and named him William Alexander Abbott. Soon after Bud's arrival, the family moved to New York's famous Coney Island, which was world-renowned for its sunbathing beauties as well as its ocean escape for city dwellers. and of course, its legendary amusement park. Coney Island's atmosphere brought together the elements of a World's Fair, an early version of Disneyland, and a roadshow carnival. As a young boy, Bud Abbott worked here at odd jobs. He drank in the streetwise lingo of the barkers, the patter of the hucksters, the spiel of the sleight of hand artists and the shillmen. He absorbed all of the speech rhythms that gave Coney Island its sideshow aura. We can only wonder how all that affected the streetwise character that he portrayed later in life. As a teenager, Bud followed in his father's footsteps working in the business end of burlesque. He got jobs in theaters as a paymaster and treasurer. In those days, shows were often promoted by staging elaborate stunts and zany enticements to the public right in the city streets. This perfectly suited Bud's Coney Island background. Bud used to stand backstage in the theater wings watching all the magic and glamour of the performers on stage. Between burlesque and vaudeville, he could see the whole spectrum of live entertainment. He was irresistibly drawn to the limelight, the acrobats and the jugglers, the singers, the big production numbers, the dancers and the chorus girls, most of all the comedians. Bud memorized all the burlesque routines by heart, and once in a while, when one member of a comedy team got sick, or more likely got drunk, Bud would fill in. He even developed an act with his pretty young bride, Betty. Bud was the straight man, and Betty was the comic, as seen in this modern recreation. It got so that Bud could quit the business end for good and become a full-time straight man. His timing was sheer genius, and comics began to seek him out. Bud Abbott was on his way. Meanwhile, back on the streets of Patterson, Lou, ten years younger than Bud, was now a teenager and building quite a local reputation for himself, not in comedy, but in sports. Lou became a state champion basketball player and then a boxer, as Lou Reed recalls. They put together a team called the Armory Five. In fact, when the, This Is Your Life was done out in Hollywood, um, all of them were still alive yet, and they were all brought out there some 30 years ago to do this, and uh, they were good. They were very good. And um, also about the boxing thing. Lou, for a very brief period, became, was a boxer. Fought under the name of, of uh, Lou King. Not, uh, he had a brief career, though until he was decked, and he said, that's enough of that. I understand his father helped to cut short that career. Absolutely. Uh, that he saw him one he, night? He, uh, he, he almost fainted. He, uh, Luke almost got knocked out. He got knocked down pretty badly. I didn't see that fight, but I heard about him. With boxing out, and after a string of mundane local jobs, Lou decided to make good on his boyhood dream of becoming a movie star. And so, with $200 of borrowed money, he set out for California. He was all of 20 years old. He hitchhiked rides in little tank towns, sometimes riding in a car or a bus. No doubt he walked much of the way, passing through America's heartland with its great fields of wheat and grasses. He ate whenever and wherever he could, 
whenever the opportunity for food presented itself. He lived off the land itself. And then it would be back to the rails, always following the sun, always looking to the west. And then at last, he reached the Pacific Ocean and the warm, sunny climate of California. Hammering and sawing were not exactly Lou's idea of stardom, but all the studios needed construction crews to create sets, and so Lou became a laborer at MGM, living on jelly sandwiches and sleeping at night in a car. When you're young and bursting with hope, all things are possible. Once in a while, he would get a bit part as a stuntman in a movie, but he soon realized that this was not the road to fame and to fortune. And so, reluctantly, he headed back to Patterson. When he got as far as Missouri, his money gave out, and fate intervened in his life. For just as in Patterson, the people in Missouri could find entertainment at music halls, burlesque palaces, and even dramatic theaters, and a local burlesque theater in St. Joseph was looking for a Dutch comic. Even though Lou didn't know exactly what a Dutch comic was, he talked his way into the job. By the happenstance, he met this man, uh, Lyons, his name was, Joe Lyons, who was a, an adult person, but he was like 45, 50 years old, had been in burlesque, and he took Lou under his wing. He saw something about Lou, but he needed a someone to slap around like Buddy turned out to be later. So I can't say that he he went through a stage where he worked his way up through phases. It's, he was full blown. He got into burlesque, start falling off the stage into a drum, uh, all kinds of things like that. Clean stuff, by the way. You know, one thinks of burlesque maybe is rather bawdy. Not much of what he did was like that ever. He never, he never was in that. Crowds began lining up to see this brash young comic. It was obvious at once that Lou had talent. He exploded onto the burlesque scene, developing his own style of comedy. He mastered timing, did pratfalls, and made influential friends. Then, as now, show business people created alluring names for themselves to look enticing on the theater marquee. Here at the U.S. Theater in Patterson, the same U.S. that Lou once attended by cutting classes from school, you can see the name Dolores Costello, a popular actress of the day, prominently displayed. One rumor has it that Lou liked the sound of the name. More importantly, his older brother Pat had become a band leader and was appearing at the Lido Venice, a Patterson nightclub, under the name of Pat Costello and his gondoliers. That was good enough for Lou. Soon billboards were announcing a new comedy star, Lou Costello. After a year in St. Joseph, Lou got some bookings back east, and he came home to the streets of his beloved Patterson. Although local theaters such as the Rivoli were now showing talking movies, right around the corner the Orpheum, a burlesque house, was still thriving, and Lou was booked here upon his return home. Now Lou's mother desperately wanted to see her son on the stage, so with cousin Lou Regis' help, Mrs. Cristilla was smuggled into the Orpheum. Well, as I said, when he got into the burlesque thing and he worked his way east and he let it be known that he'd be, be being booked into the Orpheum, uh, Orpheum, you must remember, burlesque in those days back in the 30s was thought to be a bit ladies, uh, uh, nice ladies did not go to burlesque houses. So she wanted to see him though. So I took her and we sat in the last row and she wore a hat. And it was a hot summer day. She wore a hat and even sort of a little veil and she had a kind of a handkerchief and she sat back there and watched him and laughed like the devil. So uh, I was really the one who brought her there. Wow. <laughs> wow. Did Lou know she was there? Yeah. Yeah, he knew it. Oh, yes. Wow. Now Lou began to get bookings in theaters all over the New York, New Jersey metropolitan area. 
Soon he was in great demand. It was around this time in the mid-30s when Lou's path first crossed that of Bud Abbott's as the two young men traveled the burlesque circuits. As we've already seen, Bud was now a rising star. Here, in their first photograph together, they pose outside a Minsky burlesque show. Sometimes, Bud would have Lou fill in for his partner and vice versa. Audiences immediately sensed an almost magical chemistry between these two men. Lou Reege was an eyewitness to those days, and he recalls for us their first appearance together. Lou's partner, the first one I talked about, Lyons, um, had a problem with drinking. And uh, frequently he, uh, he just about made, they did, in those days it did, like burlesque was, it was a five, five shows a day. It was a boring thing, you were a cap, you were, you were a prisoner of the circumstances, and uh, Lyons had been um, getting to be a problem anyway, and Lou, by the way, was getting to be pretty good. This is about a year or two long down the line. So, one night in Brooklyn, uh, Lyons couldn't make, couldn't get up, couldn't make the scene. And Buddy uh, was selling tickets, but he knew all these, the shticks as they call them, he knew all these routines like the back of his hand. And temporarily, he just jumped in, and it's true. And that was it. So that was the end of Lions and the beginning of Buddy. Since I'm Lou's cousin, I, I don't want to over-focus on Lou and forget Buddy, because Buddy was an integral part of Lou's success. No, no, make any mistake about that. I don't know whether Lou would have been what Lou turned out to be had it not been for Buddy. They, they were a perfect team at the right time in the right place. Buddy was a pussycat. Despite his know-it-all, street, smart guy, he, underneath, was a, do a, a doll of a guy, really, in my opinion. We all loved Buddy, the whole family. Lou's mother was more fond of Buddy some days than she was of her own son. She'd say, you're not, you're not, but whatever, she, she, she'd, she'd go after Lou. Oh, wow. So uh, Buddy, in answer to your question, was totally different from the persona he portrayed on the stage. Their brash style of knockabout slapstick comedy was a sensation, and soon a new catchphrase was sweeping the land. Hey, Abbott! Hey, Abbott! Hey, Abbott! They quickly became the best comedy team in all of burlesque. They had dozens of routines which they honed to perfection. They were unique, and they knew it. Their timing and chemistry were marvels to behold. Unfortunately, there aren't any surviving films from their first days together. However, to help us to get a sense of the boys' early comedy style in the 1930s, here are Abbott and Costello lookalikes Lou Schiara and Gil Palmer to recreate a typical burlesque routine of Bud and Lou's. So now, imagine yourself sitting in a darkened burlesque theater sometime in the late 1930s. In front of you are the rounded seats of the first row, and the stage is bathed in a reddish light. Overhead, the spotlights are anchored to metal rods, and as the colored beams come alive, onto the stage step America's newest comedy sensation, Bud Abbott and Lou Costello.
1930s, radio had become America's dominant medium. Virtually every home in the country had a radio, and the airwaves were filled with ex-vaudeville stars like Jack Benny, Bob Hope, and Fred Allen. More people could be reached in a single broadcast than in a whole lifetime on the stage. It was the next logical step for Abbott and Costello. Hmm? Miss Kate Smith. At this time, Kate Smith was a national institution, and she had one of the top-rated programs in all of radio. Hello, everybody. Lou Reed recalls how Kate Smith gave the boys their first national exposure. Yes, Kate Smith had her uh, called the Swans Down Cake Flower uh, program, and it was nationally broadcast every Thursday night. And Kate Smith somehow, somewhere, heard Lou and Bud do that routine, Who's On First? And to her, and to millions of others subsequently, but to her, that was the greatest. She, she just must have those boys on her program. And of course, Ted Collins was her manager and also her dear, dear friend. He took a dim view of it. He considered them burlesque people and might denigrate her pro program. So he more or less stalled, but she insisted. She insisted, insisted, and finally they came on. He said, I'll let them on just for once. And that was done, and the, the result was that it, it gave the boys national exposure. Up till then, they hadn't had it. At that time, broadcasts were done twice in one evening. For the East Coast, it went on at 8 o'clock, and then they broadcast at 11 o'clock for the West Coast. So. The whole country heard Lou and Bud do their thing. I don't know. What's the guy's name on third base? What's on second? Who's on second? Who's on first? I don't know. Third base. They were so popular that they stayed on the Kate Smith show for over a year, even filling in for her on vacation. Abbott and Costello were now national celebrities. They went on to Broadway and appeared with Bobby Clark and Carmen Miranda in the streets of Paris. Although not billed as the stars, they stole the show. It was such a big hit that the great impresario Mike Todd took the show to the New York World's Fair of 1939, where it was a smash all over again. Bud and Lou were named kings of the World's Fair. In 1940, Universal Studios decided to film a Jerome Kern musical called One They offered Bud and Lou supporting roles. That summer of 1940, the boys had been filling in for Fred Allen on radio. 
Then, in late August, they reported to Universal for work. They were allowed to do several of their old burlesque routines, which were cleverly worked into the plot of the movie. Once again, their zany antics stole the show. Although One Night in the Tropics was not a big hit, Abbott and Costello were. Lou arranged to have the world premiere at the Fabian Theater in Patterson. Universal used this photograph to promote the movie. Note on the marquee the words, World Premiere, Lou Costello. Here's a ticket from the premiere. When it was printed, the title was Moonlight in the Tropics. Proceeds went to rebuild Lou's boyhood church of St. Anthony's in Patterson. <laughs> By late 1940, most Americans sensed that a war was coming. The draft was instituted, and young men from all across America were being inducted into the Army. The movie studios saw the potential in doing a service comedy, so Universal gave Abbott and Costello their first starring role. The picture was Buck Privates. As two screwball soldiers in boot camp, Bud and Lou proceed to turn the U.S. Army upside down. Bud was forever manipulating naive Lou into no-win situations. Or Bud would devise a scheme to drive the sergeant crazy, and yet somehow Lou would end up suffering the consequences. The Andrews sisters added to the fun with Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy and Apple Blossom Time. The movie was a sensation. Audiences were convulsed by the zany duo. Filmed for under $200,000, Buck Privates made $4 million. Universal had struck gold. Abbott and Costello were overnight superstars. Next, Universal put the boys into a haunted house. Lou's frightened reaction to things that go bump in the night made for side-splitting laughter. Hold That Ghost was based on an old vaudeville routine about a mysterious candle that moves across a table by itself. It's a gag that would be varied many times over the years. Lou is the only one who sees the spooky event. Joan Davis, seen here, made a perfect comedy foil for Lou. Audiences laughed so hard that some of the dialogue couldn't be heard. With each new movie, their popularity soared. Audiences just couldn't get enough of Abbott and Costello. Soon, they were wrecking havoc on the Army Air Corps and keep them flying. And then they nearly sank the U.S. Navy. In the process, the boys virtually saved Universal Studios from bankruptcy. Yes, Bud and Lou were riding atop an explosion of box office receipts, the biggest in movie history. Typically, they would shoot an entire movie in four weeks. Universal churned out their films like sausages. In the first year after Buck Privates, they made six movies. A running gag was, hey, it's a dull day in Hollywood, Bud and Lou aren't filming a movie. By the end of 1941, the boys had become the biggest celebrities in Hollywood. For three years in a row, they were number one at the box office, outdrawing everybody in the industry including Clark Gable, Gary Cooper, Jimmy Stewart, and Mickey Rooney. Their antics got zanier with each new release. They started doing satires of genre films, such as the South Seas epic, which they lampooned as Pardon My Sarong. One of their best spoofs was Africa Screams, a hilarious send-off of the African jungle saga, with Lou posing as a big game hunter. <laughs> In this scene, Lou turns the tables on Bud. 
Stanley, Stanley, no, don't bother me. Stanley, you're, gonna, you're not going to kill anyone. Don't hold me back. Don't do that. Somebody's got to get it. And when I get this mad, somebody's got to get it. <laughs> the boys continued to dominate the popularity polls through the 1940s. And it seemed that each picture had a more outrageous premise than the one before. In one film, they were ordinary plumbers who crashed into high society. In Hit the Ice, they turned Sun Valley's winter resort into a virtual fun house. They hobnobbed with Mississippi riverboat gamblers in the naughty 90s, and the boys did tricks with money that have never before been seen on the Mississippi or indeed on any other river. They even went to Hollywood, and of course, they turned Tinseltown upside down. While all this was going on, the boys continued to be major stars on radio with their own weekly program featuring Hollywood's biggest personalities as guests. Their show was in the top 15 for over six years. They also did special broadcasts such as command performances on the Armed Forces Radio Network aimed at our boys overseas. And tonight, special greetings to you servicemen from the state of California. Ready to speed this sunny salute on its way is an adopted sweater girl of the Bear State. She's all wool and a sarong wide, Miss Dorothy Lamour. And now, fellas, get set for two of America's favorites, Abbott and Costello. <laughs> I understand that all the boys that's over there, they're, they're going to have a big baseball team, and I understand you're going to be the manager. That's right. Yeah? Yeah, how's Well, if you're going to be the manager of this baseball team, I would like to join myself. That's all right. I would like to know some of the guys' names on the team, so when I meet them on the street or in a ballpark, I'll be able to say hello to them. Well, naturally, I'll introduce you to the boys, and a regular bunch of boys we've got. But you know, strange as it may seem, they give these ball players very peculiar names. You need funny names. Strange names, like, um, Dizzy Dean and Daffy, Daffy Dean. I'm and their cousin. Who are you? Goofy. 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 By the mid and late 1940s, the boys encountered the great movie monsters of all time. There was Bela Lugosi, who just dropped in for a bite. Then they hung around for a while with the Frankenstein monster. They met Swami Boris Karloff, who brought them to their knees, and who later turned up as Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. The boys even got wrapped up with an ancient Egyptian mummy. They seemed to meet sinister killers on every street corner. They were constantly being chased by hoodlums, thugs, ghouls, ghosts, and monsters, all to the delighted screams of laughter of movie audiences young and old. Children especially seemed to identify with Lou. They felt that he was one of them. The little fat guy, always doing things wrong, always being pushed around by grown-ups. So in 1952, Abbott and Costello decided to create a special movie just for children. Lou plays a childlike babysitter who dreams himself into the classic fairy tale, Jack and the Beanstalk. Quiet. Want to wake up your sweet little brother? I want to see you be in trouble. Have a nice nap. This is my real business. I know kids. Good night. Get me a glass of milk. What'd you say? I said, get me a glass of milk. This is unbelievable. This kid talks better than me. You're not very bright. I'm sorry, kid. But uh, what school did you go to? The baby isn't talking. I am. I know you're talking, but who? I'm talking over here. This kid ain't even moving her lips. This is a baby ventriloquist. I'm talking over here. I know it's you. I mean, I'm... You... <laughs> you! At this point, Lou decides to read a bedtime story to his very precocious young friend. Jack and the Beanstalk. My favorite novel. Donald, can I read this to you? Well, I want to keep you happy. Let's hear how it goes. Thank you, Donald. 
<laughs> Once upon a time, that's pretty exciting, isn't it? Once upon a time... And now the movie changes from black and white into dazzling color, just like The Wizard of Oz. So, for the first time since their screen debut a decade before, Bud and Lou are seen in color. Bud plays the village butcher who is greedy for the giant's gold. Look at those footprints. Uh -oh. We must be getting close to the giant. Come on. Mr. Dinklepuss. Now, uh, wait a minute. Are you sure that hen Nellie lays golden eggs? Uh-huh. Fourteen carats? Uh-huh. Well, then don't be afraid. I won't. Just follow me. In the movie's climax, Lou satirizes an Errol Flynn-style sword fight. Because Lou felt that this movie was so special, he arranged to have the world premiere at his beloved Fabian Theater in Patterson, complete with a live stage show. There was a big homecoming parade, and the children of Patterson were filled with delight. I know, for I was one of them. From the steps of City Hall, I remember Lou pleading with the adults to please bring the children to see the movie. That night, April the 5th, 1952, the Fabian was aglow with happy faces, mine included. I was so overcome with joy that I thought my nine-year-old heart would burst from sheer happiness. The movie made back its cost in two days and was Warner Brothers' biggest grossing picture of the year in England. Later that year, the boys met Charles Lawton as Captain Kidd also filmed in color. As two dim-witted, or should we say dumb, waiters at a pirate's inn on Tortuga, they encounter the infamous buccaneer and give him a nervous breakdown. Lawton had a ball doing this movie because Lou taught him how to do double takes. Around this time, the boys had their own weekly television show, which was a big success and they were also appearing on the Colgate Comedy Hour on NBC about once a month. The relentless grind, however, began to take its toll. Lou had a history of major health problems, and as he was getting older, it was more difficult to keep up the same energy level, and their films became less frequent. It was obvious that their enthusiasm was starting to fade. As we entered the atomic age of the 1950s, America was rapidly changing, and moviegoers' tastes were changing with the times. The Cold War brought forth even more manic forms of comedy. The new team of Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis appeared on the scene. Interestingly, their very first film, At War with the Army, bears more than a striking resemblance to Buck Privates. Hey, I think you're cooking around here. Ah, oh, shut up. You've been getting away with murder and it's got to stop, you understand? Shut up! Just because we were friends before and used to work together, I've been covering up for you. That's got to stop, too, you understand? Shut up! Now get your pack and everything that goes with it and I want to see you down front in exactly five minutes. Understand? Shut up! You're going to go on a long, long journey and you may not be back this way, you understand? Shut up! It's 
Pack him, and he goes with it. Be down there in five minutes. I'll tell you, shut up! Go on a long, long trip. We're gonna be there soon. Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! Bud and Lou's comedy always had an element of wide-eyed, childlike innocence. After all, Lou's own boyhood hero was Charlie Chaplin, who personified comic innocence. And like Chaplin, Lou had the gift of pathos. Lou would go skipping off into the teeth of danger like a trusting little boy. <laughs> And Lou's attempts to be macho were a little boy's daydreams. Get it up. Steady. Now, sit up. Sit up. Sit up, you. Up, you fool. Up. Even when Bud and Lou had off-screen disagreements, the deep underlying care of one for the other shines forth. Watch this tour de force scene from Africa Screams, where Bud thinks that Lou has been eaten by a lion. How can I? Oh, snap. I just lost the best friend I ever had. <laughs> oh, he was only here. There's a kid who's never done a bit of harm to anyone. He was a nice boy. What a man he was. I never appreciate it till now. No, you didn't. You was rude to him all the time. No, it's too late. It's so old. <laughs> God. <laughs> the way I used to trap him and set him into things that were all wrong, I wouldn't, I wouldn't send my worst enemy out to do the things I taught him to do. <laughs> the way I used to cheat him. He used to slap that poor kid all over the... Oh, I used to cheat him. That kid never did nothing to nobody. He was only here. I he was a nice, a nice boy, that kid. Oh. oh, I feel like jumping off a cliff. <laughs> That's what I should do. Oh, Stanley. But no, 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 I have got the nerve. He was only here to tell me what to do, Stanley. What should I do, Stanley? Oh, I know what I'll do. It's that lion. That lion, the one that got him. I'll spend the rest of my days right here in this forest. I'll get that lion. No, you don't. I'll get that lion every time I thing I do. No, you don't have to. I'll spend my life here in this forest. Don't tell me what to do. I you don't have to get stuck. Call boss. Smell. Smell. Trump. It's really you. Sure, boss. Wait a minute. Are you all there? Sure. The lion didn't hurt you. No. It's really you, Stanley. What do you think I am, a mirage or something? You know mirage? I know mirage. You're real. Sure. You double cross. In the 1950s, Americans were already dreaming of traveling into space. Films such as Destination Moon, The Day the Earth Stood Still, when Worlds Collide and The War of the Worlds were all big box office hits. So in 1953, Abbott and Costello decided to do a spoof of these early space movies. In Abbott and Costello Go to Mars, our heroes accidentally launched themselves into space on an experimental rocket ship. On board are two bumbling stowaway bank robbers. Naturally, with Bud and Lou at the controls, the rocket ship makes a wrong turn as it leaves Earth orbit, and instead of heading for Mars, the ship sails off into deep space. Somehow, the boys wind up approaching the mysterious cloud-covered planet Venus. When they land, they discover, much to their delight, that Venus is inhabited by Miss Universe beauty pageant contestants. In recent years, Abbott and Costello Go to Mars has developed into a cult classic. But now, older and tired, their careers winding down, they only made a few more films together. In 1956, with enthusiasm fading, they made their last movie, Dance With Me Henry. Shortly after, they split up. Within three years, Lou was gone. But oh, what a sweet ride it had been. For over 20 years, these two boys from New Jersey had had the time of their lives, and so did we all. And in all the years since their passing, no one 
has ever matched their special magic and appeal. They left us laughter, joy, and warm memories of two pals named Bud and Lou. Friday, August the 20th, 1993, the Ramada Inn in Clifton, New Jersey. It's been nearly four decades since the boys dissolved their partnership. Now, a long overdue tribute has been organized by the Abbott and Costello Fan Club. Extensive newspaper and television coverage announces the details of this three-day celebration. So, here now are highlights of the sights, the sounds, and the memories of the first Abbott and Costello convention. As soon as the door is open, crowds begin filing into the corridors of the Ramada Inn. Soon the dealer rooms are filled with excited conventioneers of all ages, fans anxiously looking for Abbott and Costello souvenirs. Frank Somo, one of the convention's organizers, personally greets all of the guests, assisted by Karen Cuco, head of the Patterson Fan Club. Frank Somo, and this is the first ever yeah, Evan Costello like, uh, like Fan Club I like convention. Yeah. I love all of them. Like oh, one of the organizers. I didn't here today. I didn't see and we just hope everybody has a good time. Karen describes her activities for us. All right. I'm Karen Cuco, and I'm the base director for All the Way from Patterson. And I'm also on the Abbott and Costello First Annual Convention Committee. Okay, you want to know how it was organized? It was a brainchild of a group of people. Approximately uh, seven months ago, we came up with the idea of holding the first ever Abbott and Costello Convention. Uh, back in October, I guess it was. And what you see here is the fruits of their labor, really. Okay. We're going to hold a routine contest tonight. Uh, dealer rooms will be open, uh, cocktail party. Uh, tomorrow there will be a film room and a video room open on Saturday. Uh, oh, we have the gala tomorrow night, right? Here's the gala. A bus tour on Sunday to the museum and the statue. Um, on Saturday all day we'll be having films run uh, on Evan Costello and other great comedians such as uh, Laurel and Hardy, the Three Stooges. And Sunday we will also continue that, uh, not for the whole day though, just like 9 to 1. And uh, like you said before on the tour, we're going to end at the museum and we're having an opening exhibit. Lou Reed is an early attraction and a great favorite with the convention goers. Soon the whole family would be in evidence. Here, Lou Costello's granddaughter, Marky, poses with Bud Abbott's son, Bud Jr., and Abbott and Costello look-alikes, Lou Sciarra and Gil Palmer. Hi, guys. These two mimics make everybody feel that Bud and Lou are really here at the convention. And now, from left to right, here are Lou's daughters, Patty and Chris, then Bud, Lou's granddaughter, Kristen, and, of course, our two celebrity look-alikes. And now Marky rejoins the group for some real family-style photos. Can you believe that kid the cops There you go. Beautiful. He's 40 years old. What am I doing wrong? I got it. Okay. Chris, Patty, and Bud were a tremendous hit with all the fans many of whom later commented that they were made to feel like part of the family, that there was a special warmth permeating this convention that was unique and unexpected by the attendees. Watch now as Chris does an unintentional comedy bit with a pesky microphone as big sister Patty playfully teases from the sidelines. Yeah, Larry's gonna give you that. He needs a foot of dinner. I'm trying to think of how to... Uh, first of all, I think it's great. First of all, I think it's great. Um, <laughs> we had been working on it for a long time, at least the idea for it. Uh, the fans the fans wanted it, and I think it's great. I think it's, it's beautiful, and I just hope it's the first of many. Larry! 
Um, how many people are you expecting to come? Do you have any no, idea? I have no idea. I have no idea. I'd like to say over 5,000. <laughs> um, Packing the lobby. <laughs> some, um, anything you want to say in your vote about uh, the, the whole concept of this? Uh, well, I think the credit has to go to Larry Migliori, Frank Somo, uh, Shirley and Tony Zabo, I feel like I'm getting an Academy Award and thanking everybody. Um, Karen Cucho, Robert Atanasia, and also Father Licata, who is unable to be here for the weekend, but Larry and Frank and, and Father Licata really brought this all to fruition. So I, it's, it's exciting, you know, and as I said, we're excited to be here. My sentiments exactly. Um, I'm very, very happy and thrilled that this is taking place, and it's always fun to come back to New Jersey because I lived here as an itty bitty baby. And I just wanted to say I'm so glad that Mark Lawrence is here too because he had made uh, three movies with Dad and one, Hold, Hold That Ghost. I can just to this day see it where he's down in this basement, you know, and the, the creature, whatever it is, you know, gets him. Um, and he, he's a great actor, and I just feel very honored that he's here to, uh, to be a part of the convention. As the convention started rolling into full swing, we sought out character actor Mark Lawrence, who was the weekend's guest of honor. His face is instantly recognizable to anyone who has ever seen a gangster picture. He played the heavy in literally hundreds of roles. We soon discovered he has a very lively repartee. Oh my God, I have to confess to you, read the book. Um, any special memories of the movies you made? Certainly, here, here it is. <laughs> Here's the memories. Okay. Ask me again, ask me again. All right. Um, what kind of uh, personality do you remember Lou Costello having um, on the set? Oh, you're very, it's a very intelligent question. It's so intelligent, I got to be intelligent to answer it. What kind of personality? He's a comic. And comedy is a very serious business. What do you mean, personality? Well, I understand that. What? I under Don't interrupt me, please. Okay, go ahead. You ask me a question, I have to go on. All right, go ahead. Now I forgot what I was going to say. You, you ask me a question about comedy. Don't, 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 don't uh, jump around here. Okay. That's my book, by the way. Read it. All right. Uh, you, got, you say, you, well, they keep us around before they did On the set, Well, right. it, it is what they have to do. In comedy, you've got to be very loose. If you just, if the guy says, uh, camera, action, and then they, they act. Well, before you get that, you've got to be very loose. Your body's got to be loose. Your thinking's got to be loose. So it gives them a certain sense of freedom. Most comics do this. I know what I did. When I was in Italy, there was a, an Italian comic. Kept talking all the time. And then, but yeah, but you talk to him, then, and his camera, and he was, he was ready to do it. So it, 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 that kind of looseness, that's what you need in comedy. I did a picture with Milton Berle, tall, dark, and handsome. Milton was awful in that. Awful. You know why? Because he's memorizing lines. You can't do that in comedy. And Milton realized that when he became the great bum, bum, bum on TV, right? It was all that lip. You see? Man? He knew that, you know? He, he, he didn't get used to the business of uh, how to get loose before the take. Before the take, you had to be loose. <laughs> At this point, a crowd began to gather in response to Mark Lawrence's extremely animated comments. What are you, one of the questions? Yeah, I was going to ask, what? Um, basically, as an actor, how you had to adjust going from acting in dramatic films to doing a comedy with people like Abbott and Costello. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Shakespeare? <laughs> well, you were... How the winds of our discontent made glorious summer by the sun of York? What do you want me to do, Shakespeare? Too? Well, for example, now, a film like Key Largo that had, um... Who? Edward G. Robinson and... Benny uh, Robinson. And Lionel Barrymore Marvis and Marvis Humphrey Marvis Bogart. I mean, these are top name... So? What do you want me to do? Okay. So, what about the adjustment? You're attacking me, young No, 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 no. I don't like no, to be no, attacked. No, no. What about... The, <laughs> is, there, is there, for you, um, um, an adjustment problem of going from that type of performing to... to be read my book. I <laughs> <laughs> ah, read the book, read the okay. book. The convention has provided a gold mine of memorabilia. There are movie posters of every conceivable format and style. There are video and audio tapes of the boys' television and radio shows, plus a wide assortment of T-shirts, books, photographs, and numerous novelty items. It was here that we briefly met Ron Palumbo, 
without whom none of this would be happening. Ron is the founder and president of the Abbott and Costello Fan Club. Since 1986, he has been one of its guiding forces and the creator of the club's newsletter. Ron and film archivist Bob Fermanac have co-authored a fantastically researched book, Abbott and Costello in Hollywood. Ron is seen on the left. Thanks, Abbott and Costello, for all your help on the book. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> It's only 12 bucks. 30% off. 30% off. Special convention rate. Huh? See you again next year. Of an unconventional book. Huh? That's right. And August 21st, 1993, we'll be back here in one year. Okay. Thank you. Here, Bud Abbott listens attentively to a fan in one of the exhibition rooms. We asked Bud to give us his impressions of the convention. Well, it's, it's really wonderful, and uh, being the f our first convention, great, and uh, we've shared in the past with the Three Stooges, and uh, uh, last year was the Friends of uh, Good Time Radio, but this is our first, and the turnout is fantastic, and uh, it's wonderful. we got great fans, just great fans. As seen here, Bud's father had a very playful side, too, and he loved children. Definitely. Uh, Dad and Lou love children. They love their fans, as a matter of fact. They never turn their fans down. You know, a lot of a lot of stars avoid going places, but they didn't do that. They'd always go out. My dad always went shopping to the market, and he loved it. Uh, as far as the children go, yeah, as, as you probably know, that uh, Dad and Lou built uh, the Junior, uh, Junior Youth Foundation, Lou Costello Junior Youth Foundation down in L.A., and that was to uh, help the, get the kids off the street. And it still exists today. It was turned over to the city. But yeah, they, they, they gave a lot back. They were celebrities that gave a lot back. Abbott and Costello's genuine love for children was legendary. And Bud remembers the great fun he had being allowed on the set of his father's movies. I used to go all the time. I used to go all the time. And like I say, I used to get in trouble. I, you know, uh, do things that uh, would that cause a scene to go, you know, some loud noise, like a, a, using a squirt gun to put out a light bulb on the set when they're in the middle of a scene, a thing exploded. And I'd go ri run and hide in the restroom. But, uh, yeah, it, it was great. It was really a lot of fun. And it was, they were very happy sets. You know, they, uh, they had to keep that energy up, you know, coming from burlesque. And uh, rather than the cut stop or back, they had to keep a, a comedy uh, air going all the time, and they did. They had uh, people running around, they're getting pies in the face, and it was a chosen set to be on. You know, all, all the people there loved to work on those pictures. You can almost see Bud Abbott Sr.'s imprint in his son's words and demeanor. Listen as he speaks so beautifully of his father and Lou. Uh, I'd just like to say about this, this being their first convention, I know wherever they are, okay, they're going to be here. And uh, that's what I felt the last one. And um, it's just a wonderful honor to them. And, uh, and it makes me very, very proud. And uh, I hope we have many, many more in the future. Of course, no Abbott and Costello convention would be complete without seeing the boys themselves in action. And so, on Saturday, their movies were shown all day long in several screening rooms set up at the Ramada Inn. Here is a poster with some titles and show times. Special projection systems were brought in and installed just for the occasion. As the lights slowly dimmed, the antics of Abbott and Costello filled the darkened rooms and the sounds of laughter resounded through the corridors. Let's watch a little. Here is a clip from Africa Screams. Lou sees a gorilla as he sits down for a meal. The gag is, He's the only one who sees the ape. Good sugar. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
I'm so nervous. Don't play with it, eat it. What's the matter with you? Huh? He must be tired. As the lights come back up, you can sense that to the fans, Bud and Lou are more than just shadowy figures on a screen. For as Bud's son has observed, the presence of Abbott and Costello themselves is in some mystical way alive here at the convention, and the fans constitute an extended family. Here again, Lou Schiara and Gil Palmer, dressed up as Bud and Lou, serve to enhance the warmth and camaraderie echoing through the corridors. Our two look-alikes even did a classic Abbott and Costello routine at the banquet on Saturday night, and they added a modern-day twist that convulsed the audience. Let's watch. Well, I mean, ask me a simple little question, that's all. He, got, he asked me hard ones all the time. You've seen him do it. I don't know. Ask me a little one that even, even Tristan here can answer. <laughs> <laughs> I was kidding away, Chico. <laughs> As the afternoon wore on, it seemed that the intensity of enthusiasm in the fans increased. Here, Chris Costello has a moment to just enjoy and drink in the day's activities. And, just like the fans, she too brought along her camera to save some special memories. There's Frank Somo. This is a monthly fan newsletter called The News Hangs High, published by Bill Honor. We asked Bill how he became interested in the fan club. I found out the fan club was in existence by accident by going to the library one day, and since then I got signed up with it to uh, be a nas national base director and write a monthly newsletter, and there's also a quarterly that Ron Palumbo writes. I've had a love for Abner Costello just about all my life. I met Bud in 1968, 69, and 71 at his home, and we became good friends, and I was, I was very saddened by his loss. Some of the fans were so excited they wanted to share their feelings with us. We're talking here with three people who are uh, conventioneers at the first ever uh, Abbott and Costello convention. Could you just give us your reactions to what you've seen and heard here today, your impressions? Oh, I think it's great. I think it's wonderful, and I hope they have it every year in different locations. And I'm Larry Furman from Richmond, Virginia, and... I'm Janine Kelly from North Carolina, Raleigh. <laughs> and I'm Al Furman from North Carolina. Did you people come all that way for this, or are you? You're I drove. I drove up and picked them up at the airport. Oh, wow. Uh, any specific thing so far that sticks out in your mind? All of it. All of it. Everything. Okay. Everything. And we're looking very forward to the dinner tonight. Uh, were you here last night for? Yes. Uh huh. Okay. Anything else you'd like to say? 
just how great it is. What do you want to say? Anything? Come on, Al. It's been great. Oh, it's been Maybe great. Yeah. Okay. We look forward to all the future ones. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you. A seminar was held on Saturday afternoon by the family members. A great crowd of people turned out for the event, which was held in a large assembly room right next to an Olympic-sized swimming pool. People came armed with video cameras and obvious enthusiasm to learn behind-the-scenes stories. Let's listen in for a few minutes to some of the highlights. We begin with Chris talking about her dear friend, Bud Abbott, Jr. One of my dearest friends, and he's like a brother to me, is this guy over here. We spend every morning on the phone talking business and having coffee together. And I've got to tell you, if you ever wanted to meet Bud Abbott, Sr., you're meeting him today because this guy is one of the most genuine human beings that I've ever met. He is one of the most giving, one of the most spiritual human beings. And I often heard stories of Bud being a very spiritual man, and he really represents his father very well. There's a lot of love there. And I just think it's, it's nice that we can join together as, as the children, and then there's a next generation coming up, the grandchildren, uh, that will carry on the legacy. And hopefully they'll bond, as we have, to continue on. People would say, wow, your grandpa was Lou Costello. And I remember when I was little in grade school, in fourth grade, I would take Abbott and Costello against Frankenstein and they would play it in the auditorium for the whole school, like an assembly. And I just remember thinking and sitting there how neat it was, and that was my grandpa and how the kids were laughing and then afterwards the film, they would just, you know, they would be so wow, you know, and how great that was. But it's just been wonderful. And I guess just being here, I've really just seen I'm telling you, the fans here, it, it's just unbelievable to me. And um, really has given me a different sense of my grandfather and the heritage. In the entertainment field, it was very hard to get away from being the daughter of Lou Costello. No matter how hard you fought to try and do it on your own, somebody was always introducing you. And now, you know, here is the daughter of, and the best one was Abbott and Costello. <laughs> no, 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 it was fun. Um, <laughs> they were close, not that close. <laughs> but uh, uh, that was probably the toughest part, is just trying to do something on your own as, as Chris Costello and not being the daughter of. By using Bud Abbott Jr., who would open the doors, I could get in any door, they would at least see me. But what, the reality was that once you were through that door, it was what you had to offer in your talent to get you the jobs. And um, so, no matter what your name is, I don't know about today, but then, you had to have something back up, but it would get you in any door, which is pretty hard to take to beat them. So I think you have to work harder to prove yourself. Carrying the last name is great conversation piece, but I found when I would go on auditions or something, most of them took more time in talking about my dad than wanting to really get into me. And you had to prove yourself much more than, let's just say, Jane Smith coming in. Um, so that was an interesting element of it, too. Uh, at the time, when the same subject we were talking about, my, my dad was still alive. And, um, but my dad, I swear, he never once told me to be an actor. In fact, he told me, be a plumber, be an electrician, you know? And, and I go, well, you know, when you grow up with a, a, an actor like my dad, and a celebrity, naturally, as a kid, this is what you want to do. And uh, he would never give me any support, none whatsoever. I came from my dad's family, who was in the business at the time, my cousin Norman and Betty. I mean, I call them up and they give me interviews and they can set me up on things. But my dad, well, I'd be a plumber, be an electrician, you know, and you're not going to like it, you're not going to like that. And he was, he was right. He did turn out that way. He was absolutely right. Hi, Marvin. You're asking me a baseball question? Now you bring this up. All these years later, you bring up this question. Hi. Hi. How much, you mentioned they practiced in the garage. How much did these guys practice their routines, uh, either for the movies or for their uh, skits, burlesque, TV, whatever? Um, as for who's on first, I'm not really sure how, how long they practiced that, but a lot of the skits they did in the movies were old burlesque skits. And uh, they had, they knew the routines, and what they would do would be to just do variations on the scene sometimes. 
So, I mean, I take it back. When they got into the films, those routines were so ingrained in them that there, there wasn't a real need to, uh, in other words, to rehearse. It was simply all there. Well, we have another special guest that have joined the panel, and uh, he is probably the a real close link to Lou Costello. This is his first cousin, Lou Reed, who remembers him as a boy, and uh, who's on first, the origin. So I thought I'd like to have you give him a real strong welcome to him. He's like the first generation. So going back to things like who uh, I'm a bad boy. Mrs. Whitehead, the teacher, school number 15. She was my teacher, too. And that's a true story. Lou did pick that piece of business up on the fact that he was asked to step up to the board and write his name. I am a bad boy. Maybe not a hundred, fifty times. And he did. And he hadn't done anything that was so bad. It was a very minor misdemeanor. And he picked up on that. So all I can say is that I'm overwhelmed by your affection between the love of this guy with my cousin Lou. I could go on a long time, but I'm not going to listen. But other people have done more important things. Will that hold for the moment? When the afternoon seminar was over, it was time for fan autographs and personalized book inscriptions. Our special guest for the weekend, Mr. Mark Lawrence, will also be signing autographs for you. Buy the book. It's only 20 bucks. For... Okay. Buy the book. Let me alone. Okay. All right. I thank you. <laughs> a seemingly endless line of fans gathered to speak one-on-one -on -one with the family members. We sat down with Patty for an informal and warmly nostalgic talk. With the blue-green color of the swimming pool reflecting off her brown hair, she spoke right from the heart of home and family. When, I, when I'm around people, like fans, you know, like yourself and the others, I'm filled with a lot of love, I mean, because the love comes back to me that's generated from people like you. And when I talk about my dad, my experiences, it, uh, it, it whatever is in the back of my mind or thereabouts, it, it just kind of floats to the top and I relive it again. And it's an opportunity for me to um, be with my dad and my family again. I'm so fortunate because I have the videos, the movies, all of these things. I can see my dad, I can hear him and his his grandchildren and great-grandchildren who never had the opportunity are, feel very close to him. In the convention's official booklet, Patty relates a story about how her visiting grandchildren reacted when they saw some of Lou's movies for the very first time. We asked her to repeat that story for us. Did you care to elaborate? Well, I, yeah, I had three of the grandkids that time and they were spending some time with me during the summer and they had seen a few of the movies and so I got some of the other ones, put them on the television and had left the room and I heard these screams of laughter and I walked back into the room and there were three kids on the floor, you know, like this. They were dying. They were watching Hit the Ice. The scene where my dad is on ice skates and he's uh, being whipped around the rink and causes all kinds of havoc. The, the kids were just, they couldn't help themselves. They were laughing so hard. But it makes me feel good too because I see how Abbott and Costello humor still affects a younger generation. It reaches the kid and everybody. Well, it's been a long and happy afternoon. And with the conclusion of the seminars and the day-long activities, the crowds begin to dwindle down. Soon, it's time to get ready for the evening's big event, the gala banquet dinner. Over 200 people are expected to be on hand to share in this event, which includes guest speakers, awards, and entertainment, Abbott and Costello style. But you need a ticket to get in. Otherwise, it would look like this.
Fortunately, we are all invited. As you can see, everybody is decked out in their finest attire. There's Lou Reed sitting alongside his famous cousin's beautiful granddaughter, Kristen. Bud Abbott is having a great time. And here's Chris just relaxing for a moment. Yes, it's a really festive evening, a true celebration of two men's lives and of happy memories. The food is great, the company is even better. Here's the fan club's official photographer enjoying the party. And now our guest of honor, the one and only Mark Lawrence. Uh, I can tell you one thing, some wise guy once said, being a loser. <laughs> what can I say? I've made a lot of gangster pictures. I played the same part mostly in most of the films that I played. It wasn't uh, studying for a part. It wasn't necessary to find out what kind of character I was playing, the same character. When I worked for Abbott Costello, they did their act. They never interfered with what they did, because they knew their act very well. If they had lived, if they changed things, that was the way they felt comfortable. Comic has got to feel comfortable. Straight actor has to know when to come in. Somebody asked me today about uh, what, uh, why don't they, uh, what, what, what do they do before the take? Before an actor gets into, a, into the scene, before the comic gets into the scene. Uh, it's not to talk to somebody. They were busy uh, with some other thought. The whole technique, actually, in making films is to be fresh. With the first line you say or the first instinct that you have. And you cannot prepare an instinct. You got to let it come by itself. I can say, hey, listen, uh, uh, wait a minute, what are you doing? Oh, oh. Uh, hello, when I get for the, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll be there, uh, yeah, I'll be there tomorrow. Yes, uh, the actor said, the director says, uh, action, go, and you go from there to the, so there's a little ad libbing that goes on before the scene actually goes in. This is what uh, the comic does a great deal. He feels very loose, makes him feel loose. So a lot of actors complain about the fact they're not cued on time. That's the privilege of uh, the comic. He needs this kind of freedom. He's got to be free. He's got to be loose. This is the... What else you want to know? <laughs> you want to know something about acting or something? <laughs> anyway, I must say it's a very nice privilege to be invited here. I had a good time. I met some nice people, I met the families, lovely nice people. Patty, I love you. Chris, I love you. Bud Jr., I love you, I love you all. It's nice people. I hope this continues, this is the first one. I feel very privileged in being uh, the first one to come is to be your guest. I thank you very much for having me. Charlie Smith says goodbye. No doubt about it, Mark Lawrence was one of the convention's big hits. And Lou Reed also continued to be a center of attention. To many people, it's as if Bud and Lou themselves are really sitting here at this table enjoying the affection of their fans. We can imagine their shadowy presences nodding in approval as their children and grandchildren come forward. Let's hear it for the family. This is uh, 
um, it was a great privilege to be here. It's uh, been a dream of, I think, all of ours for a long time, especially working with the fan club and the letters that would always come in asking when we were going to have our very own convention. Um, I think each and every one of you are spectacular. It, it's been fantastic for me to be able to put faces to so many of the names that I've corresponded with through the fan club. I think you're a special group of people. Uh, just a quick note, Phyllis and Frank Richter are here, who put on the annual Three Stooges convention. And they themselves have been really fantastic to Abbott and Costello. I've never met two greater people who always made us feel like home when we would come to share the Abbott and Costello fan club table at their convention. And I think they deserve a round of applause. It made it very special for us. I think for all of us, it's also exciting to have yet the next generation, the grandchildren here, to experience their grandfather as I don't think they could have ever experienced it in LA. So I think they should be brought up too, which, which is Kristen. Uh, Cristillo and Marky Costello. Let them get their <laughs> phone. Hi. I just want to say I love you all. I'm so touched by the kindness and love that I received here. I consider you all family. And um, it was such a, a privilege to meet Mark. <laughs> I mean, I, I have known O. Charlie since I was like this high, you know, from the movie, and now I really got to meet him. Um, it, it's just been, I think, a real weekend uh, of heaven for me. Thanks a lot. Uh, my, my first convention actually was last year uh, with the uh, uh, Friends of Old Time Radio, and that was such an extreme high for me. It was just unbelievable. I mean, I left. I left New Jersey with changed. And I never expected, although I knew this was the first one, that this would even be a better one. And uh, I have feelings that it's gonna go on and get better. And I really wanna thank the people that, that put this off. Uh, it, it's, it's just incredible. And uh, the fans, hey, what can I say? Just be with us and we're gonna go to bigger places. Okay, thank you. room, Carol, who is the middle child, and I'm the middle child, um, and I just want to say I feel like she's here tonight, and I think my Uncle Butch is here tonight, and my grandfather and my grandma. Um, it's been really special being here. I've really missed my mom a lot being here, um, and she's just, she's in my thoughts every day, and um, I just wanted to bring a little bit of Carol Lou to this room tonight and um, just acknowledge her and say, um, you know, just what a wonderful mother she was and how much she brought um, my grandpa and my grandmother into my life um, because they weren't there. So um, I just want to acknowledge my mother and just say you guys have been absolutely wonderful and being here has just been, it's been, I have goosebumps at every minute and that's the best way to describe it. So that's all I wanted to say, thanks. making the first convention more spectacular than anything we could have ever dreamed of. Um, you've made grandfather spirit is alive in this room with all of you. Just thank you very much for making this a very special weekend. And so the banquet celebration comes to an end. But you know, Kristen is right. Bud and Lou's spirits are alive in our hearts and in our memories, and they'll go right on living forever. Here is your personal invitation and admission ticket to the guided bus tour of Patterson. It's a beautiful, clear Sunday afternoon in late August as our tour group assembles in Clifton under the signpost of the Ramada Inn. 
Our chartered special is a modern luxury coach with extra large windows and padded red seats. Lou Reed will be our tour guide and narrator since he knows by heart and memory all that we are going to see and hear on this visit to Lou Costello's hometown. There's Karen Cuco, who organized the tour with Lou Reed, and she also created the museum exhibit that you will see at the tour's finale. Karen tells us now how she became involved with the fan club. Um, basically, I joined because I found the slip inside a video that I had bought. I figured, why not? I'm sitting home, I have a four-year-old daughter not doing anything, so I joined it, uh, January of 91. And now I'm in the convention, I run the base, I'm, I'm doing the museum exhibit, <laughs> so I'm <laughs> doing a little of everything, and it's a lot of fun. Now our bus is approaching the city of Patterson, so, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, here is your tour guide, Mr. Lou Reed. Uh, okay, folks, now uh, our tour begins here in South Patterson, where on the left-hand side, you see right on the left-hand side of the bus, you can see the Lou Costello Sportsman Club. This building was originally a firehouse built in 1898. Lou's uncle, Peter Reed, actually my father, was a fireman here at one time, and this club is an organization dedicated to teaching kids all kinds of our sporting activities in a safe environment under supervised care. Yeah. This was a cause that was very, very close to Lou's home. Uh, Hi, Pierre. How you doing, Karen? How is everybody doing? Okay. All right, Pierre. Right, yeah. Hi. This, this picture on the wall of our building was donated by two sign painters that were situated in Patterson. They donated it. One guy made the sign, drew the drew the picture. The other guy made the uh, the lettering. And uh, what we're trying to do is keep the name of Lou Costello alive because we all love him, as well as the boxing program to keep the kids off the street. And we certainly appreciate your stop here. These are some of the kids here to come out to greet you. And we appreciate this stop, Karen. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me touch up your first stop. Flowers. Okay. Okay. See, they're working on it already. Yeah. There's a structural um, weakness and they just closed the club down temporarily. We'll be back in action. Now Lou is looking for our first major stop on the tour. This is Market Street, and just up ahead, opposite a firehouse, is Lou Costello's boyhood home. Here on our right is engine company number six where my dad came on as a rookie in 1960. Now, the family lived across the street, right over here, where I'm pointing, right over here on the left. Now, this house at 485 Market Street is where, uh, for all intents and purposes, Lou actually grew up. He lived here on the third floor for about, I'd say, 20 years. And the family moved in here just after Lou's younger sister, Marie, was born. And at that time, I would figure Lou was about five or six years old. And this is where all his boyhood memories came from. There's a story about one Christmas, Lou was about 10, 11 years old, and he had one of those Magic Lantern movie machines, which you use a candle, believe it or not, and there was no electricity. And the, they lived on the third floor, and the tree was decorated, very inflammable material. And somehow or now, Lou dropped the match into the cotton, and the thing went up, boom. And he yelled out the window, and my father came running over with an extinguisher and ran up, grabbed the tree, and threw it out the window. And Lou was sent to his room for the rest of the holidays until New Year's Day, I think. But it almost was a, a terrible thing. He, he, really, he didn't mean to do it, of course. The next stop is school number 15, which is only about six blocks from Lou's home. And this is where Lou went to grammar school. And one of the most famous lines in show business had its origins here. This is where Lou picked up that business of I'm a bad boy. It's true. Mrs. Whitehood, Whitehead, was our teacher. And for some minor infraction that Lou had committed, he was asked to go to the board and write I'm a bad boy on the blackboard, as I might have mentioned yesterday in the talk session. And somehow or another, he got kept in his memory and he picked it up as a tagline. I'm a bad boy. And that's where it began. Wow. Park. And back. 
beyond that pergola up there is a ball field in which Lou played ball, I played ball. This was our, we learned how to ice skate there. They used to flood the pond about eight inches. Now they don't do it anymore. But this is where we grew up. This is where we lived. We fought sports and chased our girlfriends and everything else. It's all right here. What position did Lou play? He was a uh, uh, left field. Left field. And then sometimes he'd do third base because he was quick. And I was a catcher because I was lazy. I didn't want to walk to the outfield. <laughs> <laughs> I, <did. laughs> I was short and husky in those days. Okay, St. Clemente Park. Just our back where we all played and ran around. I made my first communion here. Lou didn't. He, I'll show you the church that he did. My mother was Irish and she belonged to that. It's his peer. Okay. All right. Moving right along here. This is the armory. Here is the place where Lou won the Charlie Chaplin look-alike contest. Actually, it was a Halloween costume contest. And to this day, nobody really knows where he got the Chaplin outfit from. Anyway, he paraded around the arena doing pratfalls and such, which caught the attention of the judges, and he won first prize. And when he took off his mask, his whole family was stunned. World War I troops marched out of here and went off to fight and not come back, some of them. World War II. This was a gathering place for all kinds of social events. Anything that was of any consequence took place here, because it was vast, it was big. Now, Lou belonged to a, a basketball team here called the Armory Five. And Lou was good, by the way. If he had more height and he were living today, he'd be up in the brackets with with the best of them. He was he, he was a foul shooting champ of Passaic County three years in a row. I, it's a terrible looking place now, but it, back in those days it was a glory place. We're at St. Anthony's Church, which was actually a family parish. Lou's mother and dad were married here. And Lou made his first Holy Communion here and was actually confirmed here, as well as his brother, Pat. In fact, this was the center of the family's religious life. Now, as we enter St. Anthony's Church, here in the vestibule is a plaque with Lou's name inscribed, commemorating his generosity. You can also see Kate Smith's name recorded here. See it right up there on the wall, right ahead? Virtually all of what you see here is the direct result of Lou Costello's faithfulness to his boyhood church. It was really his money that rebuilt St. Anthony's to the condition you see it today. Remember, this was originally a wooden building. When Lou's father worked for Prudential as an insurance agent, and this was his debit. He worked this neighborhood for years. And he and his priest were good friends. He often ate in the rectory with him. And when Lou began to make a few bucks, this is in radio days, before Hollywood, it came about that many things were necessary. With it. it was a wooden structure at that time. And gradually, Lou got involved, to a minor degree at first, maybe a $5,000 donation. And then as he got to, out in Hollywood, he never forgot it, and he came back. And much of what you see is due to Lou's generosity. They revere him, and they should. Going through downtown Patterson, Lou Reed recalls how Costello's father, Sebastian, almost became a priest. He was studying to be a priest in, a in Italy, and he was within one year of ordination. And his father, who was an Italian policeman, got killed in some kind of a problem, and he had to come home and help Mama with the little store. Now, had he become a priest, you guys wouldn't be talking, and I wouldn't be talking today. We would, there would be no Lou Costello. <laughs> it's true. It's just a, what might have been. Luckily, his father didn't become a priest. Okay, this is Central High. I started here, I went here maybe a half a turn, and they, my school was mainly, but Lou went here, he's older than I am, and he played basketball for this team. He didn't complete it, though. This was the way he was. He was too itchy a guy. He wasn't what you call a great, he wasn't stupid by any means, but he had no patience to sit and learn whatever we learned. Lou was a very serious person. He, to be with him in a crowd, he wouldn't get any laughs. He didn't, he didn't do much like that. I don't mean... 
That's that's East, uh, Central High School, which today is now a, a, a grade school. This is our courthouse. Many of my friends are attorneys. <laughs> this building was the Orpheum Theater, which was a burlesque house back in the 1930s. This was when Lou was just starting out in show business. He appeared on the same stage as a performer that he once gazed on when he was a very young man. Note that on the facade of the building in faded print is the original sign extolling the wonders of burlesque. Okay, folks, we're now coming up to the house on 106 East 33rd Street. This is the house in which Lou lived from 1937 to 1939. Lou lived here after he and Ann were married. The first child was born, and he lived here about two years. But as I said, his parents lived here since 1928 until 1941 when he bought them a home in Hollywood. And I drove them out there in the big Fleetwood way back in 1941. And we picked out a house, and that's where they lived to the end. And I bought this house when I came back from the Army and put my parents in it. I sold it about 35 years ago. So the doll's house that you hear so much about was back in the rear here, but when we came to look at it some months ago, it was in a bad state of repair. All we could salvage was the front. And that's what you're going to see down at the museum. There's a lot of sentimentality about it. Lou's father was quite a craftsman. He wasn't a carpenter as such, but he, he built it. It was a labor of love. And it was a cutie pie. It had curtains and geraniums and boxes in the front simulated a little Cape Cod cottage. So here's where many, a lot of parties were here. A lot of celebrities came here at the time. Not in Hollywood. This was with the radio gang. That, those sort of people. So there it is. And a nice couple of black couple of boarders. She's an upscale executive. She was very courteous with us about everything. But she wanted to put a pool in here. And she was hoping we'd take it away. And we did. So that's 106 folks. <laughs> Okay, now as we swing this corner here, this is St. John's Cathedral, actually the seat of the Diocese of Patterson, and it's one of the great landmarks of the city. And its spires are clearly visible from Garrett Mountain, which overlooks Patterson. If you look over my right shoulder, it's up there on our right. My mother went here, and my grandmother went here, and my great-grandmother all attended Mass here. This section is known as Little Dublin, because at one time it was entirely all Irish, right from the old side. Oh, the mayor is waiting for us. Are you sure? I saw him on the turn of the corner. Oh, lovely. Mayor William Pasquale. Good man. Now, our police escort is guiding us to Federici Park, which is located in the heart of what used to be called Little Italy. And this is the site of the statue of Lou, which was erected about two years ago. William Pasquale, the mayor of Patterson, has personally come out to greet us. I really believe this statue is a fitting and permanent tribute to Patterson's favorite son. Here, Mayor Pasquale poses with Karen Cuco, along with Bud Abbott Jr. and myself. And by the way, Karen Cuco is the one who organized this tour. Bud is quite taken with the statue. And while we're all here, we decided to take a group shot of everybody who was on the bus tour. Beautiful. <laughs> okay, you're in. Uh, all right. One second. <laughs> If you look carefully at the background, you can spot some red brick mills. These structures date back to the dawn of American entry in the Patterson area, and they are among the oldest industrial complexes in America. Our next stop is the most visually stunning spot in Patterson. This is the spectacular Great Falls of the Passaic River, second only in size to Niagara Falls on the whole east coast of North America. 
Is it any wonder that Lou loved this city so much? The falls are Patterson's symbol and the reason the city was created, actually. Alexander Hamilton and the founding fathers of America, including George Washington, saw the falls as the ideal site to power industry in young America. They created Patterson as the country's first industrial city, a prototype of the new nation, and they called it the Federal City. Pierre D'Enfant, designer of Washington, D.C., drew up the first design of Patterson. As our tour winds down, we approach the Lou Costello Memorial Swimming Pool, where an unexpected event provides us with a show-stopping, or should we say, traffic-stopping highlight. As the bus turns into a side road, it gets stuck in a gully, and the back of the vehicle sinks into the pavement. The street has to be blocked off to all traffic. The police send for a John Deere earth mover, and Lou Reed supervises the road crew. It seems as if Lou Costello himself has provided a comic topper for the afternoon's activities. All of us on the tour have to laugh at our predicament. And so, we leave our imprint just like celebrities do at Grauman's Chinese Theater in Hollywood. Our last stop of the day is the Patterson Museum, where Karen Cuco has set up an elaborate exhibition of memorabilia of the boys' careers. Here is the doll's house that was taken from the Costello home on East 33rd Street. Note the intricate detail and workmanship that was lavished on this structure. Bud's son stares in a state of near disbelief at the sheer enormity and true-to-life scale of the doll's house. Standing with Bud is the museum director, Jack DiStefano. Yes, Karen Cuco has organized a phenomenal exhibition of memorabilia. The museum's main public meeting room has been converted into a replica of a movie theater lobby its walls decorated with actual theatrical posters of Abbott and Costello movies. Many of the posters are from foreign countries and reflect the international appeal of Bud and Lou, as Patty explains. A Moroccan fellow had been traveling through some remote area outside of Casablanca, went into a cafe, and there was an Abbott and Costello poster in there. So, <laughs> I mean, they are all over the place. The museum exhibit includes original radio scripts set out in display cases, as well as rare autographs, family photographs, poses with celebrity friends, and Patterson kids. There are promotional and advertising materials, and a collection of Abbott and Costello comic books, specially commissioned paintings, and much more. Looking now at these artifacts of the boys' careers, there is a dreamlike quality to it all, like a fairy tale. It seems too good to be true. Did it all really happen? Yes, 
Once upon a time, two boys from New Jersey charged forth into the land like knight errants of old with a great mission, that of bringing laughter to a people desperately longing for happiness. How else can you explain their mystique that decades after their passing, their films are admired and loved around the world? That people would travel from all across America to attend a memorial in their honor? Lou Reed knows why. Just plain talent, God-given talent, both of them. The chemistry. Sitting in, in a movie years ago watching Lou Costello go on all through much of the 90 minutes of the film, Buddy is telling Lou constantly what a, what a, what a nerd he is, how he's wrong, he's, he's off the mark, constantly. Buddy, where you going? I'm going home. Away from me. Take no, me. you don't. I've had enough of you. Who's the rap over here? Oh, nothing over there. You're nothing but a little jinx. You've always been a jinx to me. I don't understand it. You don't understand it. I don't understand. Go on, get yourself lost. Now I'm all alone. What's gonna happen to me now? But in the long run, in the final analysis, in the last reel, invariably Lou prevailed, and a great scream of delight would go up to these kids because they identified with that. A little fat guy like that, he came off because the average kid doesn't think of himself as being much of a person, you know. Morning, Mr. Livingston. Morning, Mr. Meister. How do we stand the general game? Well, you owe me about twenty-two cents. See you at two. Yes, sir. Don't forget. Understand it. Now they belong to the ages. They are images on faded reels of celluloid. But it's comforting to know that it wasn't just a dream. That they burst forth in all their joy and enthusiasm just at the time when they were most needed. Working their way up through the ranks of burlesque and then radio, the boys knew the heartbeat of America. From the little tank towns and the hinterlands to the beautiful farm states of the Midwest and the South to the great cities on the coastlines, they brought laughter with them every step of the way. And in those early days of World War II, when the nations of the earth were poised to devour one another and many people had given up all hope in the future, at that precise moment, Bud and Lou became international celebrities. They made us laugh in the face of terror. They showed us the absurdity of our human foibles and passions. They gave us happiness and reminded us that so long as we can laugh, we can endure anything and have hope in tomorrow. It is said that when the gates of heaven swing wide open, we shall all hear the sounds of laughter. For as was written long ago, gladness of the heart is the life of man. my dad, I can hear him. I'm so fortunate because I have the videos, the movies. I know wherever they are, okay, they're going to be here, and it makes me very, very proud. The legacy is happiness, joy. They're forever. Aren't we lucky to have been the recipient of all that? Mom, one day I'm going to be a movie star and make you proud of me. You just wait and see. You'll be the most famous mom in all the world. 